as well. I've waited three minutes, so I think we are going to get started. So I hope you're all in the right place. This is Learn with a Naturalist, Create Shelter for Wildlife During Shelter in Place. And it is led by Kevin Monroe, our self-described nature geek here. Um, but before I let him take it away, I'm just gonna say a few words. Uh, so my name is Carrie Winninger, and I am the outreach lead with the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University. And we are so happy that you have all decided to join us today. Um, our public events are usually done outside, either at our Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain, which is in Penn Grove um, in Sonoma County, or at our Galbraith Preserve, which is near Yorkville in Mendocino County. During the shelter in place, we are finding ways to reach people in new ways and connect, and we're just tickled that you've all decided to come on this ride with us. So thank you again. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what the Center for Environmental Inquiry does. It's a mouthful. What does that mean? How can we be a resource to you? Well, it's truly about all of you guys. It's no matter if you're affiliated with SSU or not. You could be a student, a parent, a government employee. Maybe you're an educator, a member of the public who's interested in this stuff. Or maybe you're, you work with an organization that's in need of environmental solutions, which is what we specialize in. So what we envision at the center is a North Bay, all working together to find sustainable solutions. And the way we wanna do that, we wanna invite you to get environmentally ready with us. That's what my shirt says, I'm not sure if you can read that. Environmentally ready. And that means something different to everybody. Um, and we want it, you to be involved in the way that makes sense for you. And some of the ways we're gonna help make that happen is giving people a firsthand understanding of our connection with the environment and also by doing skill building experiences that result in these sustainable solutions. So we're talking about helping people become aware, so motivated, prepared with knowledge and engaged with skills. Lots of ways to get involved with us. Um, you're doing one right now, you're attending these uh, public events. Uh, you can also lead public events like this. I actually see a few of you on here that have taken us up on that offer and led events yourself. Um, you can engage in research. We have lots of um, a really robust training programs. So there's naturalist training for both community members and college students. There's land management training. We have internships and jobs if you're a college student. There's data that you can access on all sorts of environmental processes. When you can partner with us on larger projects, maybe those environmental solutions that you might be looking for. So the point is that you are all important in addressing the greatest environmental challenges in history. So an engaged society is critical, diversity is critical, and I really do want to show my appreciation to all of you for being part of that. So thank you. So today we're gonna hear from Kevin Monroe. As I said, he is a self-proclaimed nature geek, which I just love that term. Um, and he's joining us all the way from Long Island, New York, where he's the director of several dozen preserves with the Nature Conservancy. And he's gonna talk all about how you guys can make uh, your backyard space into some place where wildlife can thrive. So this event today is one of our Learn with a Naturalist events. So what that means is it's really relaxed. Think about it like we're all outside at the Osborne Preserve near the Education Center where that talking circle is with the trees overhead and Kevin's our guide and he'll he'll present for a while. He'll tell us about the different projects we might want to start today, even if we don't finish them today. So one of them's a toad abode, a native bee best nesting bundle or a backyard bird buffet. Uh, and then he's going to give us all time to start these projects, ask questions, get some feedback maybe share what we're doing, um, and then we'll finish after an hour. So we encourage you all to share what you've started with us first today. Maybe we'll all hold up to the camera like what we've done. Um, and then also we would love to see your finished products. So if you do have a chance to send us a quick photo um, or write something to us or post on our Facebook page, we'd love to see what you guys have all created at the end of this. And if it's something you want to include uh, for more of the public to see, we're actually trying to make an anthology of works that were created from our public events. Some things like photos or art pieces or poetry. And we would love to include these projects in that anthology. So that is a sincere invitation to send us things whenever you're done even if that takes a week or two weeks, or maybe you don't even get done till summer. Uh, feel free and reach out then. 
So I do think everyone's here. I haven't had to admit anyone in a while. So I am gonna do what, um, instead of a sign-in sheet, I'm just gonna ask you all to type your names in the chat box. And I see there's some kids here. So if you don't wanna write kids' names, that's okay. Just write like plus one kid. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to match you with your um, registration because sometimes the usernames on Zoom are not the same. And I wanna make sure I know who's here to send emails to about this event later. Um, so if you could all do that in the chat box, that'd be really helpful. Thank you very much, everyone, I see. Awesome. Okay, great. So I'm done. Kevin, hey. take it away. Awesome. Carrie, thank you so much. Welcome to all of you. Gosh, I think we've got over 30 people. It's fantastic that you've all showed up and we're all together and you're all interested in some uh, backyard habitat. Uh, just a real quick piece about my sort of California connection. I lived in California for four years. Very recently, I lived in Sebastopol. I worked at Laguna Foundation and I did a bunch of really fun volunteer programs with Carrie and Margo and Suzanne um, at CEI. And we had a great time chasing um, crickets and bats and all sorts of nocturnal critters and had a good time. So very happy to virtually be in California with you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and then we will get started. Let's see. Take me a second to get myself together here. Here we go. Okay. Well, again, welcome everybody. Really looking forward to talking to you about finding ways to invite wildlife onto your property, whether it's your backyard or maybe you're working with a school or a church or a local business. This is a neat thing to be doing while we're all home sheltering in place ourselves. Before I jump into the rest of the slides, I want to mention, um, you know, the main thing here is we want to inspire you and get you excited about interacting with wildlife um, on your property. Don't feel you have to memorize anything today. This whole presentation is being recorded, including my narration, all of it. So you will be able to go back and watch it as many times as you want later, look at the slides. Also, I will be staying on for about 20 minutes after the program's done to answer any questions you might have. And um, I'm gonna be sharing my email with you later too. So just think of this slideshow as kind of the first step. Okay, so the first question is why are we creating shelter for wildlife? Most cities and rural landscapes are either sort of static or they're actually shrinking. Suburban landscapes are expanding. So this makes backyard gardeners like yourselves, stewards of one of our fastest growing wildlife habitats and managers of one of tomorrow's dominant landscapes. So this picture here, this is a friend of mine. This is um, from their yard in Virginia. You can see the difference between the before and after picture. This could be anywhere in suburbia in the United States. So you can also make this change. This just took them a couple years. So you can create habitat, you can create sanctuary wherever you're living and you can make a difference just as substantial. Now what's special about California? There's so much, <laughs> but what really stands out for today's presentation is that California has the highest level of biodiversity of any state in the country. There's 50 states and you guys are the winners. This is amazing. In addition, California also has more endemic species than any other single state. Those are species found nowhere else but California. So that's very special and what a neat state to be in to be trying to bring some of that diversity into your yard. So what are some basic sort of hows and what's of attracting wildlife? Um, these are just kind of a couple tips to think about. I'm going to focus on just a few of them. Diversity attracts diversity. So you want plants that are blooming and fruiting at different seasons. You want different heights and layers in your wildlife habitat. You want different structures. Think about the whole food web. It's easy to start thinking about the animals that come to your yard almost as pets, but think of them as a whole food web. They're going to be eating each other. That's okay. <laughs> Be open to things adapting. Whatever welcome mat you set out for wildlife, something you're not expecting is going to show up. So you're going to need to be flexible and have a fun time with the new critters that come and go from your yard. And have it fit your property. 
it probably isn't going to make sense for you to try to create wolverine habitat, <laughs> but salamander habitat makes sense. So whatever your goals are, make it fit the property you're working with. Whoops. There we go. So I love talking about insects. It's one of my favorite groups of animals, and I often feel like they're the forgotten layer. Insects are so important. What is that newt stalking about? What's the toad staring at? What's the swallow feeding its baby? What is that adorable bat dreaming about? Insects, 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 because that's what everybody eats. So it's such an important part of your landscape. These are all insects that are beneficial to have in your yard. Insects often get a bad wrap, but 75 to 85 percent of them are beneficial. All these critters you want to have in your landscape. A couple basics here. Um, what do insects do for your yard? They eat pests, they pollinate, they turn plant waste into great soil, they aerate and improve your soil. Part of this means accepting small amounts of damage. It's okay to have leaves that have holes in them that have bite marks from insects. That's okay. It means they're doing their job and your yard's healthy. Predator insects are so important. Things like assassin bugs, like that picture, praying mantids, dragonflies, even hornets. Those insect predators are really important. Now we all love caterpillars, right? They're cute, they turn into butterflies, they have wonderful markings. They're also really important food sources. What do almost all baby songbirds eat? Caterpillars, caterpillars, caterpillars. Even hummingbirds that drink nectar, crossbills and other seed-eating birds, they all feed caterpillars to their young. So it makes them super important if you care about birds. And of course, they turn into pretty amazing things like the Cecropia moth. So it's good to have caterpillars munching on our leaves. They turn into butterflies, which pollinate. Some other cool insects that are great to have in your yard, native bees. Honeybees sort of get all the press and honeybees are great, but there are hundreds of different kinds of native bees that really need our help more. They're in more trouble than honeybees. They're wonderful pollinators. There's a great article there about bumblebee conservation that we'll send to all of you afterwards. Other cool insects that show up in your yard are tiger beetles. They're great predators with the little jaws. They eat grubs and, and moths, so they're good for pest control. Dragonflies eat mosquitoes all day, right? Mosquitoes and gnats, so we love dragonflies in our yard. Here's an assassin bug eating a Japanese beetle. Hats off to anything that can stomach munching on a Japanese beetle, so we love them. Cicadas, not only do cicadas make pretty interesting summer sounds that I associate with summer and love them for that reason, but their little nymphs spend many years aerating the soil. And then when they have their big emergences and many of them die, that's forest wide fertilizer feeding all of those trees. Beetles, 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 right? There's more beetles than everything else combined. Wonderful to have them in your yard. They're good bird food. They're beautiful. Some of them are wasp mimics, like this one on the lower right. Ichneumon wasps that cannot sting, they use their ovipositors to drill straight through solid wood to lay their eggs and parasitize beetle grubs. So they help control beetle grub populations. So it's a wonderful predator to have in your yard. Lace wings, not only are they beautiful, but their larvae do what? Their larvae eat aphids and caterpillars. Good pest control. Surfeit flies or hover flies, which are mostly bee mimics, beautiful native critters whose larvae eat aphids. And I've also thrown in some pictures of bee flies, a great native pollinator. There are beetles that eat nothing but fungus. How cool is that? Let's have those in our yard. And let's not forget the cleanup crew. Carrion beetles, dung beetles, rove beetles that are eating dung and dead animals. Without them, we'd be in trouble. So thank goodness for them. Okay, so let's talk about some of the habitats you want these critters to live in that you can create in your yard. One of them is a pocket meadow or native plant garden. I think of it as a vertical herbaceous jungle. It can be relatively low maintenance. You can have something blooming spring through fall, even longer being there in California. Diversity attracts diversity. I mentioned that before. You want flowers of, that bloom at different times, different colors, different heights. That's a list of really cool native plants, but always be sure to check with your local native plant society to find out what's best for your locale. 
So there's lots of different ways to create a pocket meadow or a native plant garden. It can be near the water, it can be in your backyard, it can be along a nice wide mode trail, it can include blackberries for food. Grasses and sedges are such an important component of it. So don't forget those. I do want to mention though, we all, you know, you all live in Northern California, fire is an issue. How can you be fire aware? Well, there's a couple ways. One is you could try to mow your pocket meadow every like July before fire season really starts. Or another way is just make your pocket meadow really tiny in a ditch where it's more moist or just do a container garden. Your pocket meadow, your native plant garden can all be in steel and ceramic pots that are not flammable and you can move them around and that can be very fire safe. So who's gonna to come to this? Goldfinches, hummingbirds, beautiful native sparrows, buntings, lazuli bunting. Who doesn't want this critter in your yard? Speaking of birds, a really good plant to use in your pocket meadow are coneflowers. But again, always consult your native, your local native plant society. They'll tell you what plants are best for your area. And of course, we've already talked about butterflies. They're gonna to come to your pocket meadow along with these great native bees and tiger beetles and flies, dragonflies hunt in meadows. And a quick word about spiders, there are thousands of spiders in every single acre of forest and especially meadow eating thousands of insects. What an important way to keep the balance. You want spiders on your property. So what are a couple tips in general, big picture, for using native plants, not just in a pocket meadow? Well, here are three that I always try to use when I'm landscaping with native plants. Cluster. Rather than just a couple plants of many different species, make some nice sizable clusters that's going to attract more wildlife. It's less maintenance. Again, I've mentioned this before, it's so important all seasons, fruits, flowers, and leaves, 12 months a year. And then number three, layers and shelter. You want to have a layered native plant landscape. Again, with layers, depth, dense, shelter, go vertical. If you have a skinny space, plant up, plant some tall plants, some tall wildflowers. You want a lot of room and shelter for animals to hide. Maybe you have no space. You've got a balcony, you have a six foot concrete slab behind your house, that's okay. Make a ladder garden, use containers, pots, go vertical, stack, cluster. Even in an apartment balcony, you can do something. Different time, times and types of fruit. We talked about that a little bit. It's so important. Fruits at different times of the year. Bluebird young will want sweet fruits in the summer and then completely different fruits in the fall and winter for hungry adults. So you need different fruits, different times of year. Another example, lots of birds love elderberry fruits in the summer. You have a lot of exhausted parent birds who need a sugar high to keep going and they're eating those elderberry. But then in the fall, they need a totally different kind of fruit. They need something that's very fatty and oily and heavy to give them calories for migrating sometimes thousands of miles. So you want different kinds of plants for them. Okay, we're gonna jump now into an other type of backyard shelter you can create, a brush shelter. Couple basics. It's a woody structure that's close to the ground to attract those ground critters. You want layers, you want the branches to interweave. Think of it as a trellis for native flowering vines to grow over your brush shelter. And it really helps if it's at least partially in the sunlight. That means sunbathing wildlife. So this is a great diagram that shows you this is not just a pile of sticks. You're building this purposefully with logs, rocks, old pipes. It's layers. You want lots of spaces in there for critters. Again, you guys are in Northern California. Fire is an issue. So if this looks like it's too much of a fire hazard for your property, use non-flammable ingredients. Use rocks, pipes, old ceramic pots. Don't use wood or use very moist rotten logs, but be fire aware, be fire safe. Some critters are gonna come. Northern towhees will not only visit, they will nest in your brush shelter. Quail, wrens, woodpeckers, all sorts of wonderful birds. Herps which is short for reptiles and amphibians, love brush shelters. So these are all California, Sonoma County critters that could come. If you build your brush shelter right next to your wildlife pool, 
you'll get even more herbs. And of course, insects and millipedes. They love brush shelters and rock shelters and old pipes, including sunbathing butterflies on the top of your brush shelter. Another large woody structure or shelter are snags, which is a standing dead tree. If you have a dead tree that's close to your house and you're concerned about it for safety reasons, as you should be, then you can cut off the top if it's completely dead. Even a 10 foot snag will attract wildlife. This pileated woodpecker, the largest woodpecker in North America, is on a 10 foot snag in that picture there. All sorts of cool critters use the cavities in snags as nesting, shelter, and hibernating habitat, including this very sleepy tree frog taking a nap. Okay, so we're gonna jump to another type of habitat you can have in your backyard, your wildlife pool. Think of it as a shallow, marshy pool rather than a pond, and it's almost better if it doesn't have fish, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Some basic things to keep in mind, you want it shallow, you want vegetation, you want structure in there, you want logs, rocks, branches. So why is fishless good? Well, there are some salamanders, frogs, and dragonflies that only breed in shallow, fishless, temporary pools, often called vernal pools. So you'll actually get more wildlife without fish. Well, California, like much of the country, is having lots of issues with drought. So that's okay, because a lot of these wildlife like temporary pools, you can allow your wildlife pool to dry out in June or July. So you don't have to feel guilty about filling up with a hose during a drought. It's okay if it dries up in the summer. These species will finish their life cycle by June or early July. Just some pictures of some structure, vegetation, shallow, gradual slope for animals to crawl in and out. Here are some critters using that structure and vegetation. You can have all of these in your yard. And there are birds that will not come to a bird feeder, or at least it's very difficult. Tanagers, warblers, robins, but they got to drink. Everybody's got to drink, right? So they'll come to your shallow, gradually sloped wildlife pool. If you want a step-by-step -step guide on exactly how to make, maintain, and manage this pond, these are two great websites. Again, this will all be sent to you, so don't worry about having to write that down. But both of those have step-by-step -step guides on exactly how to do this. So what are some sort of big picture things to keep in mind now that we've looked at all these different possibilities and your head's probably swimming. <laughs> and again, don't worry, you'll be able to go back and look and listen to this recording again. Biodiversity, that's a real goal for your wildlife shelter, for your backyard habitat. The world is really in a biodiversity crisis right now so you can help on your property. Keep track of what you see, record all of it on iNaturalist. Reproduction and breeding. Are things actually creating babies on your property? Do you have baby birds, baby snakes, baby lizards, baby dragonflies, baby flying squirrels? That's a good sign. Keep track of that. Have that as a goal. Predators. Predators are nature's stamp of approval. That shows that the ecosystem is healthy enough for some critters to actually come and feed there. When a heron shows up and starts eating your frogs, and salamanders and dragonflies. That can be a little unnerving at first, I understand. But remember, you're trying to create a sanctuary for the whole food web. The fact that the herons there is a good thing. There will be more salamanders and frogs that will come back. So that's kind of the big picture of what you're trying to create. Okay, we're gonna jump now into getting you ready to do your do-it-yourself projects. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you from big to small. I'm gonna talk about each of these projects on a large scale, and then we're gonna jump down to what you're actually gonna to do today. So HERP, again, which is Reptiles and Amphibians, Refugia. We talked a little bit about this. We looked at this diagram, your multi-layered rock, pipe, and brush shelter. Great for HERPs as well as other critters. Tony, who's a local, who lives right there in Sebastopol and has his own website and a 200-page book on all of this that's just brilliant has this wonderful sketch that shows it starts underground. Almost all herps spend a good part of their lives buried underground. So you want your rock and wood shelter to start one or two feet below the ground. Start by digging 
not by piling. And this is a good diagram that shows that. Here's Tony and some high school kids hard at work, showing that you've got a lot of soil contact with the rocks and logs. They've actually buried and placed the logs and rocks down in the ground. They actually have a buried pipe there. Really important for herps. And this is what you're gonna do today. You're gonna do a mini version of what you just looked at, a toad abode. And it's just taking all those principles on a smaller level. We're gonna talk about those details again in a second, but this is your goal, one of your goals for today. What's another possible habitat today? Well, it's the nesting boxes for bees, for native bees. These are some really cool examples. If you kind of want to go big, some people, as you can see, have gone really big. And these aren't just for native bees. These are also for lady beetles, beetles, earwigs, spiders, fireflies, all sorts of other critters that will use these sort of insect hotels. Just some other pictures showing variations of them. And there's a little mason bee flying in and out of the tube someone's provided. The female goes in, lays a couple eggs, and then builds a little mud cell wall, as you can see, to keep them moist and safe from birds. And this is what you're going to be doing, a native bee nesting bundle. It's what we just talked about on a smaller level. You're going to tie them together. You're going to hang them from a tree. We'll go into more detail on that in just a second, but that's what you can visualize. Last one are these little bird feeders. So this is one of the absolute easiest. We've all grown up with this. You take a pine cone, you roll it in peanut butter, but you can take that to another level. You can put grapes and cranberries and raisins and a bit of apples and almonds and pumpkin seeds. You can really get creative, put lots of different kinds of foods in there, make it a hanging apple feeder instead of a pine cone feeder. You can use peanut butter. You don't have to use peanut butter, use almond butter. You can get really creative with it. I didn't mention this, but if you happen to have an orange, I just uh, sort of threw this slide together yesterday. Orioles and tanagers, and there are two species of Orioles that live right in Sonoma County. They will come and eat oranges, or you can turn an old orange into a little mini bird feeder itself. Egg cartons. This is such a neat, easy upcycling. Carrie and I were just talking about upcycling. I would do this a little differently, and I put different foods in each one of those little cells. So you could sort of do a citizen science thing. Are they eating corn? Are you eating grapes, popcorn? You can sort of experiment. Great thing to do with kids, as you can see. Okay, so you've sort of seen the pictures. You've gotten some images. We're gonna go over this slide, but before we do, does anybody have any questions they wanna ask before we get um, elbows deep into our project here? And maybe, Carrie, maybe you can facilitate if there's any questions that have come up, and if not, we'll just jump in. There was one question in the chat box. Great. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read it out loud. It's simple, it's what about carpenter bees? Uh, are they good or bad to have in your backyard habitat? Excellent question, excellent question. I love carpenter bees. They are native, they're really interesting. Um, the males, as is the case with all bees and wasps, don't sting, only Females have ovipositors, which is what a stinger is. The reason I mention that is male carpenter bees are very curious. They'll often come and hover right in front of your face, which can be a little alarming, but they can't sting. So they're just curious. Carpenter bees are great. They can make holes in your deck or your balcony. So if you provide these bee bundles with a large enough diameter, they can come to those bee bundles instead of your deck. If they are coming to your deck, you can use a combination of steel, wool, and wire mesh to stop them from burrowing into the deck. They're wonderful bird food, and they're great pollinators. Great, thorough answer. We have another question that I was actually wondering if you could say something about for your water habitat. Someone wants to know about mosquito control. Yes, oh, I'm so glad someone asked that. So I would say two things. First, I'll start with saying there's something called BT, that's the letters BT, mosquito dunks. They look like little dried bagels. It's a naturally occurring bacteria. It's not a pesticide. It's a naturally occurring bacteria that is species specific. It only eats mosquito larvae. You can buy those 
They float in your pool. They will not hurt damsel or dragonfly nymphs or frogs or tadpoles or amphibians, but the bacteria will dissolve in the water and kill mosquito larvae. However, bigger picture, I would say if you have a healthy aquatic system, your mosquitoes are gonna be very low. Mosquitoes are a problem when you have water gathering in an old flower pot, an old tire sitting in a backyard, a trash can lid, they can breed in a tablespoon of water. If you have dragonflies, frogs, salamanders, songbirds, they're gonna eat your mosquitoes. So if you have a healthy aquatic habitat with lots of plants and perching space, those predators will take care of your mosquitoes. And someone has a follow-up question, not just about animals that might live in the water, but would the BT hurt animals that drink the water like bees? That's an excellent question. I'll tell you what I've been told so I guess I'll say what I quote, no, unquote. They are sold at bird feeders to put in your bird bath. And they are sold in, in bird feeder stores, I'm sorry, in bird feeder stores by folks that I trust that really seem to know what they're doing. So I would, you know, do your own research so you feel comfortable, but BT rings are sold at bird feeder stores to put in bird baths. So my understanding is it is safe, but I would you know, suggest do your own research to make sure you feel comfortable. And that was all the questions. Oh, there we go. A couple came in from chat just right now. Are there oh. risks with attracting less favorable animals like raccoons, opossums, or rats when you're making the bird buffet? And I, I'm sorry, Carrie, could you start that question again? Sure. Are there any risks with attracting less favorable animals like raccoons, opossums, or rats when making the bird buffet? Yes, that is an excellent question. Again, you know, when you set out a welcome mat, things are gonna show up that you didn't plan. <laughs> um, if you go to a store that sells bird feeders, they have bird feeders that are specifically set up to be sort of mammal proof, that raccoons, possums, even squirrels cannot get on. There's all sorts of ways to make your bird feeder squirrel, raccoon, and possum proof. The bird feeders we're making today are very simple, sort of temporary, semi-disposable feeders. And there's a good chance that you might have some other critters coming to it. I would say if that's a concern, share away, shy away from anything um, peanut butter related. <laughs> Don't use peanut butter or almond butter, anything oily or buttery, maybe even shy away from nuts. If you just use fruits and seeds, you'll have less of those mammals visiting. And, and if it's, it's a real concern of yours, then wait until you can go to a store and get a mammal-proof bird feeder. And I might just add that opossums are really great at controlling ticks. So just uh, oh. you know, maybe qualifying what less favorable means. <laughs> very good point. Very, very good point. Um, so if someone else has a question here, um, it's back to the carpenter bees. It's about if you already have carpenter bees burrowing in your porch timbers, is there a season to exclude or discourage them? And, you know, I, I'm imagining that um, this person might want to know, will this, this bee condo make it a worse problem or will, you know, by attracting more of them? Uh, and they also said uh, they've been hesitant to use any pesticides because uh, they're aware that these bees are great pollinators. Sure. That's a really good question. And I know, you know, um, carpenter bees can do small amounts of damage that can build up over time. So I, it's a good question. I would say, I, I'll just give you some information and you can decide what to do with it. This time of year in May, the odds are that the female carpenter bee has probably, not definitely, but probably already laid an egg in there. So if you try to get rid of the carpenter bees now by putting wire mesh over it, it might mean that there's an egg in there. I guess I would say big picture, there's lots of carpenter bees, they're not rare. If you're concerned they're hurting your deck, I think it's okay if there's a couple carpenter bee casualties. <laughs> That's your decision to make in your yard, but you could um, sort of wait until they're away from the hole, stuff some steel wool in there and put wire mesh over it and they can't get back in. Or you can wait until they're all done, which is gonna be like September, October, and then carpenter bee proof your area in October. Up to you. 
And then I'm going to have one more comment from someone, and then it's time for us to go do our activity. So uh, just a great comment that opossums are also good at cleaning up roadkill, uh, and maybe that's a reason they become roadkill so often. Yes, yes. Uh, possums are incredibly adaptable. They eat everything. They're great scavengers. Wonderful animal to have around. So it all comes down to thinking about what's appropriate for, site, for your site, what do you want in your yard, and then adapting and being nimble to the fact that things you didn't invite are going to show up. <laughs> okay, so, so we... Yeah, at this point, um, I think what we can do is everybody can kind of unmute themselves. And if you want to go back at, away from us, feel free to leave the space to go set up your tote boat or get your materials or whatnot. Um, Kevin might have a few more instructions, but we'll also both of us stay here in case you want to show us what you're making or get advice about materials. Um, and we are going to go all the way up till, let's see, it's 339. So let's say 350. Give us 11 minutes, and uh, then at that point, we'll kind of compare what we've done so far and see if there's any other questions and wrap up. So Kevin, is there anything else you want to say? All up, no, that was perfect. All I'll add is that everything you need is up on the screen there, all those directions. Carrie and I are going to stay, as she said. And I just want to mention, in case you're feeling overwhelmed by this, you can just start this. You can just go outside and come up with a plan and finish it later. Don't feel rushed. Great. So um, one person was hoping you could put the slide for the toad abode back on the screen, but I kind of think that we need to see all of these. So maybe if anybody um, wants to, you can take a, a screenshot of this slide. And then maybe, Kevin, would you mind going and putting up each of the larger slides about each activity up for maybe 30 seconds each? And people could take a screenshot if they want. Yeah, definitely. I, we will do exactly that. So here's the toad abode. So you can take a screenshot of that with your phone. It's really quite simple. It's basically a flower pot and some rocks. You can really get creative and bury it halfway underground. You can put a dish of water. You can involve some rocks, some logs, but you can make it very simple. And it looks like you don't need to break a flower pot. You could just use a regular one, turn it upside down on top of some stones and the toad can crawl underneath. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Here are the bee bundles. If you want to take a picture, you're taking hollow to semi-hollow stems or tubes of some kind, whether it's woody or grass, you're tying it together as the instructions explain and you're hanging it up somewhere. You can take a picture, you can put it in a can if you wanna make it a little more fancy. How long do each, does each stick need to be to be successful? Five to 15, I'm sorry, five to 18 inches. So it could be pretty short. It can be very short. The pine cones are pretty self-explanatory. You probably don't need a picture of that. It's a pine cone hanging from a string. <laughs> Oranges, if you happen to have an orange lying around, pretty self-explanatory. There is the egg carton, recycling buffet, also pretty simple. And then I'm gonna try to do this really quick. <laughs> this is the paper towel bird feeder with spoons sticking through it, cut with a knife and duct tape holding them in place. I couldn't find a picture of it because I don't think it exists outside of my, my head. <laughs> so there's, there's that. Okay, let me share the screen again. Okay. Awesome. Well, I do encourage you all at this point, the, the most formal part of the event is over. So I know I muted a few of you throughout the presentation, but now at this point, let's just unmute everybody. And it might get a little loud. So if there's some background noise, please mute yourself again, but I'm gonna go ahead and click unmute all. So everybody can be heard. Um, so just mute yourself if you want to be remuted. Bye, bye Carrie. Keep your own video on. And I think maybe as you stand 30 seconds, why don't we take this slide away so that we can see everybody's faces. That's okay. so fun. <laughs> I'm going to actually go oh, get myself an orange. Got a background. No. Oh. Participant, there we are. <laughs> oh, uh, question, Kevin. I'll make sure I can actually see Kevin.
here. Okay, great. So somebody in the chat wrote, I put out oranges for the Bullocks Orioles. Yes. I have seen, and there's no interest. Should I put the oranges in a particular shape? Yeah, Orioles can be very tricky. I would say Ooh. Orioles aren't going to come to your yard because you have oranges. If you already have orange, uh, Orioles, <laughs> then they will fly down to them. You want them to be done? want them as high off the ground as you can get. So if, if you can put them 10, 10 15 feet off the ground, that's better. And you want them in the country. Orioles like big trees. So if you live in a part of California that has open areas with big trees, you probably have Orioles. We have them. Great. <laughs> we, but we feed them um, hummingbird food. Even better. Wonderful. Yeah, they love it. They come every spring. That's great. That's yeah. Pretty. Yeah, you, you, you all have bullet Orioles and hooded Orioles. You have two species of Orioles. Yeah, we've only seen the bullets. No, we're just seeing the hooded, hooded the this, hooded year. this year. We usually have both. Yeah. Wonderful. What project are you guys going to, are you going to try and do one of these projects right now, Lynn? Well, so um, hollow. <laughs> uh, we could just go outside. It's so hot out. Yeah. It's like, Okay, you I just want to do the fro the toad abode. Toad abodes are fun. We have a little pond and a cool place, right? Yeah. And, um, and the nice thing about toad abodes is they'll also attract several species of California salamanders, <laughs> lizards. Yeah. You could have some really cool little beetles in there. Now, the, the toad gets all the press, but yeah. <laughs> and the beetles. Somebody wants to know about lemons, if they can work instead of oranges. <laughs> they, they might. I have never heard uh, someone put no. lemons for Orioles, which doesn't mean it's not done. It might be that they're too bitter. Um, it might also be that the color of the orange is part of what attracts the Orioles. <laughs> put out the lemons and see what happens. Well, everybody, I'm actually going to stop moderating because I really want to make one of these things in the next five minutes. So, Kevin, right. um, if you could see if anyone has questions verbally, anybody who has a question, just start talking. <laughs> and if you need a moderator, maybe if you, I see Margo's there, maybe she can help. But I'm going to go get an orange. <laughs> sure, sure, yep. I'm, All right, I'm, me too. I'm going to go put the orange out with the, the sugar feeder. Wonderful. <laughs> It says here, how about apples instead of oranges? That's fine. Yeah. Apples are great. I don't know if Orioles will eat them, but woodpeckers and other birds might. Someone says, what tube diameter is best for nesting bundles? I would say about twice the diameter of a straw. Somewhere between the diameter of a straw and twice the diameter of a straw. That's about perfect. If you want carpenter bees, you need to pick. Here's my orange. Awesome. It's on a um, chopstick. Excellent. Yeah, see, and that's that's really I'll all you need it. to do. You can, you can put that outside in some way, and you'll have something come to it. It might be butterflies or moths or flower flies. It might okay. be oils. You never know. Now, if, it, if it's in the ground, though, it's, is it too low? For an Oriole to come down? I would say if it's in the ground, you're unlikely to have an Oriole. It's possible, but they okay. like to stay about six or seven feet off the ground or higher. Okay. So you might try sticking it, you know, maybe <laughs> between the branches of a tree. Probably. How about this one right here? I've got a question. Please, yes. Um, I'm from Santa Rosa from Sebastopol. Mm -hmm. and I was in Sebastopol, like, I didn't have so much diversity, everything. And now I'm in a beautiful garden. But there are either a lot of crows and a lot of blue jays, but I don't have any birds. Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I've never seen um, a lizard or a salamander or anything where I'm living now. So I'm wondering. I don't know what's wrong. Why? Why? And, I, and it's a garden full of a lot of diversity of plants. Um, I don't know how to get 
more diversity in here. So are, are you close to any even semi-natural area corridor, like a stream or a, a ditch or a city park? Yeah, there's an open space preserve close to me. Um, yeah, it's an open space preserve. Okay, okay. So um, some of the animals we're talking about are nocturnal. Some of those herbs come out at night. So you might try up some of these habitats and then going out after dark and seeing if anything shows up. Um, it may also be that you need to focus on things that are gonna fly in. Maybe for some reason it's just not a good neighborhood for herbs. So maybe really focus on attracting some butterflies and songbirds. Okay, you have to get butterflies. But how do you get the, so the songbirds here? Yeah, yeah. So um, water is one of the best ways because everybody needs to drink. So I would set out some water in a very visible place that has a space around it so that they're not afraid of cats sneaking up. Um, and I would, if you have a lot of crows and jays, I would suggest once the shelter in place is over, <laughs> going to a bird feeder store or shopping on Amazon and looking for a bird feeder that only works for little songbirds. You can get bird feeders that big birds cannot use. That'll keep the blue jays and crows off and allow the songbirds. Okay. okay. But you might want to do some really large, colorful, tall wildflowers to pull animals down in out of the sky to see your yard. Okay. And, and then the water feature should be elevated a little bit. Yes, it, it should be maybe two feet off the ground and in the open so birds aren't afraid that a cat's hiding. Okay. And then where are the salamanders coming from? The salamanders are coming from moist, woody places. So whatever the closest forest is, if you don't have a wooded area that has leaf litter and logs and rocks, you might not have any salamanders in your Okay. But you probably have lizards. Okay. I just haven't, yeah. I mean, maybe other critters are getting them. Okay, thank you so much. I'll go back well, to it. Hold on. It's just a chopstick. Huh? Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Carolyn, I'm looking at your orange bird feeder. I love it. That's a great <laughs> feeder, Carolyn. Yeah. <laughs> just shoot it. No. Hey, there. Oh, your egg carton feeder. Fantastic. So, Mar Mar Margo, what did you put in it? Keeping it upside down. What? Well, that's it up. Well, yeah. no, no, you did it. You're I'm fine. I'm really impressed with what you all are doing. Got to be sheltered. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to, to hop on. Mm. Mm. Things that's really special about Sonoma yeah. County is you are close to the ocean. You're not that far from the Mayakama Hills. You're close to grasslands. You're close to redwoods. So many of the Perfect. birds that live in Ooh, California. Deep. Are somewhere in Sonoma County, so you could do amazing things with. Found it up over. So they don't have a step up. Well, hi guys. It is one minute. Oh, to be back. All right. Can you hold it. I have an idea. No, I have an idea. And in that very brief time, I got my. I didn't have an orange. I had a tangerine, so I made do. Got a little tangerine with some chopsticks. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> Carrie. That was or Carrie. That was so fast. <laughs> and I just I tied it. it, so it was just. I didn't even need any wire or tape. And now I have my bag of bird seed, and I'm literally just like perfect. <laughs> perfect. And you know, you could make a couple of those. You could put bird seed in one, you could put almonds in another, you could put raisins in a third one. You could see what birds come to what different types of food. How fun. And I see Carolyn. How five minutes. Yeah, that's fantastic. What did everyone else make? 
No, stick my neck. I'm seeing a bee bundle. Ooh, wow. That's a I'm professional looking bee bundle. What is the container, that square container? Yeah, right up in that nook there. Um, excuse me? Oh, yeah. Nice. JJ Weissman, I see the name is on the screen. What is the, um, the square container that you used? Box that we had. Uh, um, uh, oh, I see. Like a wood box. Yeah, perfect. A question here from Terry. Will, it, will any time with an opening work for nesting bundles? Yes, basically, imagine you're a little tiny bee. <laughs> There's still one more in there. You just want to get in there and lay eggs. So you, one too. you want a wooden tube, a ceramic tube that has enough space for a bee to get in and lay eggs, get out. If it's completely hollow, that's He's eating the orange. <laughs> The length of the bundle should be anywhere from five <laughs> inches to 18 inches. Anywhere from five inches. Yeah, that orange. Three. All right. Yeah, I'm double checking. Um, it's fine. Kevin, did you answer about why to get paper clips already? I, I didn't. Sorry. The paper clips can be a great way to make it possible for you to hang your egg carton bird feeder or your paper towel. <laughs> You can put paper clips at the end, put string, and that's how you hang it. Mm. You could also use it as a way to hang your bee bundles. Did you answer about what tube diameter is best? Yes, anything from the diameter of a straw to twice the diameter of a straw. That's about perfect. Oh. Someone asked how many. Oh, it's empty, huh? Um, I put it right up. Oh. I would say you want at least five or six in a bundle. You could have as many as 15 in a bundle. Anyway, from five to 15 per bundle. Well, you guys are all inspiring me right now. I wonder if you're all willing to do something with me. So I have <laughs> on a screen right now. Would you be willing to hold okay. up your creations as close as you possibly can? And in fact, <laughs> If I could yeah. purposely have all children's faces of okay, I'd like to post this on yeah. Facebook, but I don't want any kids' faces to be shown. Okay. So if you could hold it in front of your face, right? Um, and if you can't do that, then I just ask the kids to not have to go. So oh, I, I love the, the, the bee bundle in the box. And if you want to, like, show us. I saw someone's water. That's perfect. Show us your little habitat. All right. I'm going to take a picture in five, four, three, two, one. Awesome, guys. Let's do that one more time for anyone who missed it. And we are going to take a photo in five, four, three, two, one. Wow, we have so many different things here. I think we got all of the activities covered, Kevin. I am so inspired. You all did that so quickly and so well. They look better than the pictures in the slideshow. You, you all are crazy talented. We're going to have so much great wildlife in our this backyard is now. This is going to be cool. You can tell your neighbors, you can tell your friends and your family, and you could have wildlife do it yourself parties. Obviously, as long as you're practicing social distance and you're being safe. You can clearly do it over Zoom. You could have a Zoom totally party. Totally do it over Zoom. Totally. You could have 100 people doing this together over Zoom. So inspire other people. Too, Rod. So I have another question from somebody. And feel free to shout out questions if you want. You can keep writing them in the chat. Um, will Black Widows like the bee bundles? That's a really good question because black wi widows are relatively common in Sonoma County. When I lived at Sebastopol, I saw a lot of black widows, and what it made me realize was they're oh, not the very aggressive. Yeah, I don't like it over there anymore. They're all over my yard, and I never them. They are venomous. It is important to be careful of them. You want to be sort of black widow aware. No, I do not think black widows are like bundles as long as you have it off the ground. Black widows we'll like the water structures. They're on the ground. They're on your house, in your shed. They're in a log pile. They're not going to be climbing in a tree. 
So if this is hanging from a tree, you're not going to have black wood. And Kevin, if anybody is um, having like a background noise, if you could go ahead and mute yourself, that would help us hear Kevin. But I want to keep the mics on if possible for people to ask questions. What so looks like Carrie and Kevin. This is this is Kathy. I don't know if you can see my screen, but I'm showing you where um, we had some pine trees cut down when we had them because of the pine beetle. When we had them cut down, we had them cut down very tall. They're about 15 feet tall. Fantastic. Had woodpeckers come and make nests in them, and now we've got other birds also using those nesting holes. That is so inspiring, and it's so wonderful you did that and. You might try going out there after dark, take a flashlight and put red cellophane paper over it so you're not hurting animals' eyes. You might have flying squirrels. Oh. You might have pygmy owls. Who knows what you might have in that snag if you check it out after dark. We, we do have bats. Wonderful, even better. Yeah, thank bats. you. Thanks for showing us that, great example. Somebody wanted you to repeat one more time um, how long the bundles of hollow sticks should be. Sure, anywhere from five to 18 inches. So basically anywhere from half a foot to a foot and a half. Wow, guys, it is 3.59. This was the perfect timing. I am so happy that you guys joined us. I do want to say a couple words. And then after that, Kevin's offered to stick around a little longer so that we can make either more work on what we've already started or maybe even start on a second one. So really quick, I just wanna let you guys know about some other things because this event is just one of dozens of events that we have uh, that are all virtual this spring. So a couple, and, and they keep continue to be added. So if you've already gone to our calendar and you're like, oh, I've seen them all, I'm done. Nope, there's more there now. <laughs> so we've added more and we continue to add more. Um, and tomorrow we have an event that is a citizen science event I'm very excited about it. It's by an SSU graduate who's been involved with the center in a lot of different ways as a student, an employee, and a volunteer, and she's now working with the conservation board. So it's all about Cal Flora, which is a website and a phone app, and it's a really powerful tool for those of you guys that are interested in native plants. Um, then next Monday, our own SSU CEI nature tech lead, Chris Hawley, gives us an, a deep dive into the world of waves sound and bird sampling. So it brings together physics and birding in a way that's really accessible to all people. Um, and then a week from tomorrow is, the, is one of our Citizen Science Friday events. Um, it's SSU professor Wendy St. John talking about Western pond turtles last week. And this time she's talking about aqua bugs, invertebrates and water quality. So it's talking about how you can use a phone app called aqua bugs to look at what is in your creeks and ponds and rivers. And then the day after that, Friday, May 7th, is the next citizen science event. And that time in, oh, I already wrote that one. Uh, that's today. So um, there's more after that as well. We also have one that is not even on the website yet, but it will be announced soon. And it's going to be about nature photography. And that one's gonna be the Friday after that. Um, which I believe is the 22nd. So take an eye, keep an eye out for that appearing on our website really soon. Um, so please stay safe, enjoy nature, and keep doing what you're all doing. You're doing a great job. Thank you for being involved. Um, and so that's all I have to say. So from here on out, we can just have fun and ask Kevin any other questions and make some more of our activities. Oh, I see someone's hand up. Does um, Carlin and Daniela have a question? Um, yeah. Well, my aunt is, um, Claudia, <laughs> Claudia Luke. Oh, your aunt is the Claudia Luke? Well, wow. welcome. We're very happy to have you here. For the people that don't know who that is, that's the director of the Center for Environmental Inquiry. She's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> we hope she's nice. Yeah. That's oh, I'm great. so glad you guys got to join. Where are you calling in from? Seattle. Seattle. Mm -hmm. wow. Welcome. What can we expect to attract? We made a tote boat. What What do you think we could find? We live on a kind of a ravine, um, you know, in the city, but it's it's a ways up from the the actual stream. And there's like a little stream that's down somewhere. Yeah. 
Excellent. Well, toads are very adventurous because they have bumpy, dry skin. They can travel <laughs> far from water. So you could still get toads. You could also get um, something called an arboreal salamander, which does quite a bit of adventuring. I think you probably have skinks, you could, which is a type of lizard. You could have skinks in your abode. You could have banana slugs, which is pretty <laughs> cool. You could have some really neat beetles. I, I would take a close look at it after dark. Go out after dark with a flashlight and see if you have any crickets oh. or beetles well, or millipedes. And we also know, but we do know that we have roly-poly beetles. Oh, well, there you go. You'll have roly-polies keeping the toad company. <laughs> Thank you. Great. He knows all the stuff from Seattle to New York to Bay Area, California. We're so lucky to have you. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. It's really polies. What eats really poly balls? Ball. So I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question and while I do, I'm actually gonna show these other two slides if I can yeah. So um as I talk about roly polies, these are some great books, some really good resources. This will all be sent to you, but these are really, really good books that go over everything we've talked about today. Okay. Roly polies put out a little bit of a scent to defend themselves from animals, and they don't taste that great. So, yeah. them. there's not a lot that eats them. I think wrens would probably eat them. There are some lizards. Toads might actually eat them, but there are a lot of animals that do not eat roly polies because they they purposefully have a taste that makes them uh, give you a little bit of a, a tummy ache. <laughs> I like the fact that um, roly polies are one of our only land crustaceans. Yes, yes, they're related to hermit crabs and horseshoe crabs. And wow. So I did want to say, somebody wrote in the comments, um, I neglected to actually say the website itself. I guess I'd assumed everybody got the email when they registered, but maybe there's some new people on, which I'm very excited. And of course, this is being recorded, so anyone who's seeing this for the first time recorded, the website that has all of our events is cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar. And that's where you can see the listing by date of all upcoming events. And you can also click on a tab called past events to see what we've already made. And that's where the recordings of all these events will be housed. It's such a special resource. And BEI is just such a neat group of folks. I, I hope all of you come back and do many programs. These are some websites that will all be sent to you so you don't have to memorize any of these. These are resources for everything we've talked about. So you could take a much deeper dive and, and learn more. All really good websites. And then I'll just go back to those, those books. Right. Book. Yeah, now I will take this off so that we can just go back to seeing each other. <laughs> Does anybody have any more questions? I have a question. Um, where is the best spot to hang the bee abode? In the shade or the sun? The main That's thing is you want, you want shelter from rain. Now I realize <laughs> in Sonoma County right now, rain's not really an issue. Um, so I would say you want it somewhere where it's not gonna get blown around too much. So maybe shelter from the wind. Okay. Um, and you know, ideally if it's getting like 50% shade during the day, and 50% sun, that's probably just about right. 50-50 sun and shade and protected from the wind. And you want it high enough off the ground so ground animals aren't gonna eat it. So it'd be good if it's made sort of like high level. Thank you very much. Kevin, I just hung up my, my orange beer. Oh, yeah. Does that look about right on the ground? That's perfect, Carrie, that's perfect. <laughs> I can't wait to hear what shows up there. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, you guys can keep track of what you see. If you don't have an iNaturalist account, you can try creating one. It's so simple. I am not um, very good with, with technology, and I was able to set up an iNaturalist account. And then you can start recording 
every cool critter that shows up in your yard. You can talk to other iNaturalist members. You can share ideas from them. Maybe you're, ha you're having a problem with your bird feeder. They can help you solve it. There's a huge community of people out there, including Northern California, who love doing this stuff. So you can connect with them and get lots of ideas and lots of help. And actually, we did our very first virtual event this spring on iNaturalist and what that app is and how to use it. So when we get these videos posted, take a look. It was on April 10th. And it, so if you go to that page back in our past events, um, pretty soon here you'll see a link to a YouTube video of that event which outlines how to set up iNaturalist, how to use it. Um, so you use that in conjunction with it. Wonderful. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Um, go ahead. Yes. Well, that's a raised um, hand first. Um, we might have to leave soon because we have a very low battery. Okay. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll be sorry to see you go. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah, so, I, uh, did Becky have something to say? Yeah, somebody gave me this um, box. Oh, that, nice. um, okay. The Beautiful. thing is, is that I've had it for over a year and very little has gone into it, um, except I think the birds come and take this stuff out a lot yes yes or squirrels do but the i don't know what's going on with all those little tubes things i don't know why no one's getting in there so just a couple ideas and and this is sort of good anytime something's not working yeah. try moving it around maybe yeah. there's something about that location that bees don't like so um remove it from that location and try hanging it on a tree Try a different sun exposure. Maybe where it is is too hot or too cool. So just experiment, move it around your yard. Um, of course, bees like nectar. So maybe try adding some additional native wildflowers to your yard. And maybe that combined with moving the box will, will make it more used. OK. All right. Thank you so much. What a treat this was. You're welcome. It's fun for me, too. Dead my soul. <laughs> Did you help bring students today? I was wondering, so many families. It's so wonderful to see so many families join us. Oh, it, it's great. And you know, you can try to talk to some of your children's or all of your children's teachers about this. You know, what we just did could be very easily done at school which I guess is September, right? Kids don't probably be back in September, but that gives you plenty of time to maybe talk to the teachers yeah. now and then, and you can do these projects in the, in the grounds at your kids' schools. Great idea, Kevin. It looks like we still have a, a nice little crew of 11 people. Does anyone have anything they wanna ask, or maybe they just wanna share? Yeah. You're just like, you're so cool. I just want to hang out with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that's not something that I get a lot, but that's something that Carrie gets a lot. Yeah. Carrie, is, Carrie is pretty cool. <laughs> Kevin, you just haven't gotten enough exposure. <laughs> Bye. Thank so, you. Thank you. you. We're thank you. Thank you for joining Bye. us. Bye. 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 Algae, you, algae out of our pond. Yeah. What would the algae be good for to pull out of the pond? Okay, so you're it? right. So are are you asking what to do with the algae once you pull it out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah sure. I mean, <laughs> algae, algae is very nutrient rich, so okay. it's wonderful for your garden. So okay. take that take that algae. I would say dry it out first, put it in the sun and dry it, and then use it as fertilizer for your vegetables, for your fruits, for your flowers. Okay, great. Then it won't be laying around the pond all the time. Exactly. <laughs> great, that great idea to make sure that all, all the unwanted material gets turned into something useful. Yeah. All right, all right. You can always just put it in your compost bin, if nothing else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. We'll let Bye. you go now.
I have a message I'm double checking. Great, yeah. Lots of people are writing that they're going to go make oh. they're gonna go make this stuff later. So <laughs> make a little pawn. They're off to you inspired action, Kevin. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well you're all a very inspiring group and I'm just amazed at how quickly everybody made stuff. That was great. No. Yeah. No. I, if I know it, I don't know how to turn it off, so I'll, we'll just <laughs> stick around. So I was just say that I actually think it's probably okay for us to just call it the end right now, don't you think, Kevin? Yeah. Awesome. That's yeah. Fun. Well, thank you all so much, and I'll see you next time. Sounds all right. great. Again, to yeah. all of you, Nancy, Kevin, and have fun. Stay safe and stay connected to nature. Yes, indeed. Thanks, everybody. Bye.